record. So I'm recording this call, so if anyone that can make it, um, we'll put it up on the website and on our YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, let's let's go ahead and begin. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone um, for joining, and especially our speakers. Um, very much looking forward to to diving into the world of slow fish. Um, I'm very excited to see where we end up in Denver, uh, Slow Food Nations, and, and the conversations that will be happening in San Francisco as well um, for the Slow Fish Conference there. Uh, so again, thank you all very much. And then just a quick update from the National Office. Um, as you all may know, we recently launched our Plant a Seed campaign. So we're busy putting together garden kits here in the office. Um, we've shipped out our first order to schools and we're putting together chapter kits and kits are also available for purchase um, from individuals. And then also of notes, we have the Slow Food Leader Summit tickets um, are on sale. And we have secured funding for at least 50 uh, scholarships and to apply for a scholarship that closes on March 12th. And then so we have Slow, Food, or Slow Fish 2018, uh, hosted by Slow Food San Francisco, which we will hear more about shortly, um, happening on April 14th through the 16th. And then following that, we have Slow Food Nations in Denver, July 13th through the 15th, and Terra Madre in September from the 20th through the 24th. So we have a very, very busy uh, year ahead of us. Um, and with that said, let's get started. Okay, Ian, do you want me to just uh, 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 begin? Yep, sounds good. Yep, okay. Hi folks, this is Kevin Scribner, um, and uh, I'm speaking from Portland, Oregon, and I'm just gonna introduce uh, the concept. Oh gosh, I've got a, a train coming by here, so where I am, so sorry for that. I'll try to move away from the train. Um, and uh, so we've got a crew to talk about Slowfish USA. I'm, I'm joined by my colleague uh, Gary Granada uh, with Slow Food New Orleans and, and uh, Slow Food Alabama, and then uh, uh, Kelly Geyser from Slow Food San Francisco, and then uh, Shara Schaffler from Slow Food San Diego, and then Kala Stoll from One Fish Foundation in Maine. And so we'll, we'll cover a, a number of topics in the in the call today, but I just want to give in, start out by uh, uh, just giving a, a bit of a background on the origin of slow fish. And but also let me give a, just a little other little background on myself is that uh, um, I commercially fished for 20 years, mostly for salmon, and most of that in Alaska. And then for the last 20 years, I've been more involved on the seafood seafood side of the system, and also then working to working on behalf of salmon. Uh, and making sure the ecosystems are safe for salmon. But in terms of slow fish, um, slow fish began in, uh, in, uh, out of Slow Food International um, in 2007, or at least the, we had the first expression of uh, slow fish, and it was in Genoa in the year 2000. And so it continues to have that, that gathering in Genoa um, on the odd years, you know, as a as a counterpose to Terra Madre, Terra Madre on the even years, and so um, in 2013, one of our colleagues, Brett Polly, uh, who was who couldn't be on this call, he's traveling. He attended uh, Slowfish Genoa in uh, 2013, and when he came back, he came back and made a presentation to the uh, Slow Food Leadership Conference in New Orleans. And that's when I became aware of Slow Fish and Brett Polly because one of my colleagues from Portland attended that leadership conference, came back to Portland and said, hey, Kevin, I think you should get a hold of Brett, which I did. Um, and out of, uh, Brett and I decided that um, it was, uh, it was uh, a good time to launch Slow Fish USA knowing that there was already slow fish canada in operation there's been slow fish europe slow fish istanbul i think there's slow fish peru so knowing that there had been other countries or regions that that had a slow fish initiative we decided well it was it was high time for the us to do that 
And um, so Brett and I put together what we called a charting committee. Um, and it was composed of folks that we knew of that were in the community-based fishermen world. And uh, um, to just, we began to have um, convenings and uh, conference calls about just to chart the forward, the progress of charting what, what Slow Fish USA could be. We didn't want to make any presumptions about, you know, having a small group presume what Slow Fish USA could be. We just wanted to chart, chart a course for the emergence of Slow Fish USA. And we were ably uh, advised by uh, the then um, director of Slow Fish International, Michelle Mismain. Um, and so she was on every call with us. And we are also um, ably advised by our colleagues in Slow Fish Canada. And so that charting committee started in 2013. And uh, um, a number of us then went to uh, Terra Madre in 2014, where we had Michelle put together uh, four days of conversations about slow fish, where we were able to uh, meet you know, our, our, the colleagues from uh, many, many other countries, and that really energized us as well. On the on, with the Pacific Coast um, uh, of the states, there was interest. In, I got a call from Charity Kenyon, who's on our who's on the call now, about trying to loop together folks on the, with the Pacific states. So I did that and put a uh, a call together um, for Slow Fish. And at our second call, we uh, we were joined. That was in May of 2015. And we were joined on that call by Greg, Gary Granada from Genoa, uh, who was asking uh, about um, if we would support having a slow fish in North America event in New Orleans. So, Gary, I think this is time to actually hand it over to you to tell the story about what then happened from there on. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. So in uh, 2015, a lot of people in New Orleans started getting uh, becoming aware of slow fish. Uh, we have numerous organizations that are working with our fishery and coast. Uh, Louisiana is the second largest fishery in North America behind Bristol Bay and the most rapidly disappearing region in the world. And uh, so it's something we're all very aware of and, and work passionately towards telling this story. And we'd actually shared this story in 2014 at Teta Madre with our delegation that we called Louisiana's Washing Away. And uh, some of you may have seen us with our t-shirts, with, with our disappearing coast. And so then uh, I traveled to 2015 Excuse me, if, uh, if if you're not speaking, please be on mute because there's a lot of background noise. So, you know, it's kind of hard to talk over that. There's a lot of background noise here, so please be on mute. Thank you. Um, somebody's not getting that memo. I can't, I, I can't hear. So, uh, anyway, I traveled to Genoa with uh, Dane and Christina Hahn who were the co-chairs of Slow Food New Orleans. And we presented at Genoa and uh, invited the world to come to New Orleans, which was which would have been the first ever gathering of slow fish outside of Genoa. Uh, there actually was supposed to have been a slow fish in October of 2015. And I was actually invited to speak at it in Istanbul, but there was a little bit of a military coup that at that. So, New Orleans wound up being the first slow fish outside of Genoa. Um, we then worked hard to uh, organize that along with many people on the call to work on the programming. And we were patterning the gathering after several festivals that were at the uh, French Quarter and the French Market, which is precisely the old U.S. Mint, which is a Louisiana State Museum that stayed the art, would allow us to stream it uh, uh, and also video archive everything that happened. And so we were, it was going to be a four day gathering, two days of it were going to be a festival in which we'd be engaging the public. And then we were going to, the fourth day was planned to be 
a uh, traditional Louisiana seafood boil and Cajun boucherie, which many people didn't get at the beginning, but we called that slow fish meat, slow meat. Because to really understand, you know, the story, and I'm not a fisher. My background's in nutrition and exercise physiology. But especially living in Louisiana, when you start realizing that all of these fossil fuels are being extracted out of our wetland and destroying our wetland, over 50% of that goes into the global industrial commodity food. And particularly in Louisiana, so much of our industrial food is 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 grown in the central plains and all that runoff comes down and creates the largest anoxic dead zone in our waters so we are really at the confluent we are at the front lines of climate change and all this has happened with the uh global commodity food industry and so we had a, that's the reason we want to do a boil and boucherie which is a cajun tradition of slaughtering a hog uh really for survival and we wanted to have both slow meat and slow fish there together to realize that it's not a coastal issue it's not a land issue it's one ecosystem uh we had we've worked with many artists performers and scientists in louisiana on, on all of our issues and 30 minutes before i was about to give the opening speech and turn it over some incredible performers to do this interactive performance to open the conference we got noticed that state of Louisiana had declared a state of emergency because of a 500-year flood on the western portion of the state. And since it was a state of emergency and we were in a state facility, we lost our state. We then walked 10 blocks down to uh, a warehouse where my kind of off-color Mardi Gras crew houses all of its boats. And Collis in his blog wrote the best thing. Here we were gathered in the historic U.S. Mint for the first ever slow fish. And 15 minutes later, we were in a warehouse with paper mache effects. But that was in many ways appropriate because that is New Orleans. And it let everybody attending the conference know what it's like to be in diaspora. And we were a conference in diaspora for three days while this storm which didn't hit New Orleans, but flooded almost every parish in the state. And people died, levees broke, and, and communities were flooded, devastated with a 500-year flood. It's starting to happen regularity along the coast, the thunderstorms just moving in and 30 inches of rain in 24 hours. And I've got to ask one more time. I'm the only one speaking. If you're not on mute, you're really being inconsiderate to everybody on this call because I can't hear myself talk. Jerry, so please me? press mute on your phone. Here I'm going to mute everyone and then, oh. un then I'm going to unmute you. Give me one moment. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here in my house by myself, shouting. I'm like, well, why am I shouting? So sorry about that. But anyway, um, that's the story of slow, uh, slow fish New Orleans. And even though you know we found a way to have an amazing gathering, although we had to cancel our festival, um, and uh, that's kind of how, uh, with Kevin's work with launching Slow Fish, we now have pretty much established a pretty good working group uh to advance this cause and again you know my work which is now transitioning into vanishing foodways to gather stories of river basins around the world to connect river basins to the oceans and collect all those stories um you know that's where we are now with slow fish and kelly was one of our attendees uh at in New Orleans, and when we met in Denver, she just pulled me aside and said, New Orleans is so great, we want to do it in San Francisco, which I think is appropriate, and I'll end this with uh, Tennessee Williams' famous quote, that America has three great cities, uh, New York, New Orleans, and San Francisco, everywhere else is Cleveland, and since we're going to San Francisco, I think Tennessee Williams will be really happy that we're continuing with his work, so I think, Kelly, your next stop. Thanks, Gary. Um, I'm hoping that I, I'm coming out okay. Um, just let me know if uh, I need to take my headphones off because I know that there's, I've had some problems with it in the past 
So, um, yes, I... from this call. Um, I was sent there by my employer back then and um, um, after the fact of having a five-year flood, um, it was a wonderful event. I met a lot of solid folks and uh, came back here really inspired. Um, fast forward, a year later, I was sitting with a scientist friend of mine from NOAA, um, and she was telling me uh, after we had a devastating crabbing season um, about um, the crabs, and within five years, because of the demonic acid and the um, the acidification in the oceans and the warming of the oceans that the crabs would no longer have hard shells within five years. Um, and I asked her, well, does the fish, do the fishing people know this? Do the crab guys know this? Um, and there was, I don't think any communication between what's going on in science and what's going on with the fishing industry or the fishing communities here, um, or not much. And so that was my kind of big inspiration to bring Slowfish here at that moment um, to get a group of people together in one room. Um, when I saw Gary and Kevin in Denver this last summer, um, I said, hey, can we do this in San Francisco? What is it, what is it gonna take? Let's get this going and they, we're both like, yes, let's do it. And um, so I was not on the San Francisco board when I went to New Orleans. We are a fairly new board. Um, we're about just over a year old, um, an entire, uh, entirely new board. Um, and right now due to um, some women having pregnancies or moving away or deaths in families, we are a board of four. Um, so we're a small board in a large city, um, but we have a pretty solid group of folks, Collis, Sarah, Gary, Kevin, um, and some other folks that have joined together to help us um, create this Slowfish uh, conference in April. So I'm very excited. And um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk a little bit about it. So Ian, this is this is Kevin. I'm just coming in back to um, just say a little bit before uh, Sarah comes on. Is uh, we're just so so we're so excited about you know the leadership with uh, with Slow Food New Orleans to step up and and host Slow Food fish for the first time and that was a great opportunity to bring fishermen foodies and chefs together as Gary noted and and to also um, it really helped the community-based fishermen um, who came in from around the country to realize that they were not alone and they you know just because I think folks should understand that the community-based fishermen have some of the same issues of isolation um, uh, difficulty of getting into the markets that small farmers have and so it was really great to get everybody together and building confidence within the fishermen community community-based fishermen that there are tools out there there are people out there there are, there are consumers and chefs out there that really want to help um, uh, help us make be successful and then with this idea of keeping the momentum going with uh, with San Francisco, and we're we're we are forward looking from San Francisco, Slowfish San Francisco, looking ahead to the next um, Slowfish event, wherever it will be. And Kelly's board is really committed to actually making sure that some of the proceeds from Slowfish San Francisco 
are in the bank to help the next slow fish uh, event going. So it's a, it's just a, it's a really, as I call it, it's a sea grassroots of a movement that's really got a lot of energy to it. So, so having said that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah from Slow Food uh, San Diego. Hi everyone, thanks for having us. And um, I apologize, but somebody popped in my office when Gary was talking, and I wondered if. Um, if anybody mentioned who all came to Slowfish 2016, I know Kevin and Gary gave a pretty good snapshot of what happened there and what we did. Um, I'll just read, I'll just give you a, a snapshot of who came. So we had over 200 fishermen, chefs, scholars, activists, students, and community organizers. We had attendees from 20 U.S. states, including all the coastal states and three Canadian coastal provinces, plus Germany, Costa Rica, Mexico, Colombia, and Italy and then a variety of nonprofit and government organizations and over 20 Slow Food USA convivia plus Slow Fish Canada. We're in Slow Fish 2016. So just to reiterate what Kevin and Gary were saying, it was a great, um, it was a really successful and wonderful event. Um, and what Kevin asked me to chat with, oh, somebody needs to mute, I hear some backing up. So what uh, Kevin asked me to talk to you about was um, one example of a slow fish success, and that's one of the things we're going to focus on in San Francisco. Um, we'll talk a lot about successes, what makes them successes, how they came about. And um, one that's been of interest to the slow fish community is in San Diego, there is a fisherman's market. This is a market where fishermen sell directly to the public. There aren't many like this in the U.S. Um, it's, it's every Saturday from 8 until about 1 p.m. until or until Jesus runs out. It's been running for about three years. It was a big uphill battle um, or effort for the fishermen to make happen because there were, they couldn't get a permit because fishermen's markets were in the California Health and Safety Code. Farmers markets were, fishermen markets weren't. So eventually, um, a politician in San Diego got wind of this, had the county give them a temporary permit, directed the county to draft legislation for California to change the code so they could get along, uh, an actual real permit. And the Pacific the Plate Bill passed, I think, unanimously in um, California legislature, making fishermen's market legal in California, um, which is pretty great. Um, on top of that, um, the fisherman's market here really exemplifies slow fish values in a number of ways. So if we just look at the good, clean, and fair, um, it's it's a great way for the public to meet their fishermen and to interact with them. The food is good. Um, the fish is good. It's direct from the fishermen, fresh off the boat. You really can't get much, get much fresher in San Diego. Despite us being a coastal port, we, um, like many, many places in the U.S., have very little uh seafood that we can buy in the stores that's harvested locally. Um, but this is harvested locally and sold direct to the consumer by the people that catch it. Um, it's clean because all U.S. fisheries are sustainable. Our U.S. fishermen are some of the most regulated in the world. If there's something that's wrong with um, the fish population or maybe an endangered turtle that fishing might fishing activity might affect our fishermen are required to do something about it, either change their gear, change their location, the time they're fishing, or even shut down until the population that we're worried about, the fish or the protected animal like a turtle or a dolphin, um, until that population recovers. Um, the fair exemplifies, I'm sorry, the market exemplifies fair because the fishermen are actually getting um, more money, a better price for their fish when they sell direct to the consumer and the consumer pays a better price from their perspective for the fish because, you know, they're cutting out the middleman. Um, and on top of that, it really hasn't harmed. It's actually helped other local seafood markets, one that focuses mostly on local San Diego markets. I'm sorry. They, they source about 30, 20, 30 percent of the seafood from San Diego fishermen. Um, and then the rest of it is from other local fisheries, which could be California or Mexico. They said they've seen an uptick in their because of the interest that this market has. I think somebody needs to mute. Sorry. 
um, they've seen an uptick in their sales. So it's been kind of a win-win-win all around for the consumers, the fishermen, some of the processors too. Um, it's a great way that for the fishermen to connect with each other. It's an opportunity where there are, a lot of them are in the same place at the same time. So they can talk about conditions. They can talk about what they're going to bring to the market so they can coordinate. Um, you bring this rockfish. I'm bringing this rockfish. So, oh, okay, you're bringing that one next week. Okay, then I'll fish here. I'll fish for this. Um, and the fishermen have actually, I understand it changed some of their fishing. They, they're more often engaging and what we call portfolio fishing, which is instead of fishing for um, a, a large quantity of one type of fish so that they can have enough that a processor wants to buy from them, they fish for a smaller amount of a variety of fish to, um, to make it appealing to the consumer. Um, and we call it portfolio fishing, and it's generally seen as more environmentally uh, benign. Um, and this this effort has also gotten a lot of national, uh, certainly a lot of interest locally from local publications, but it's also been featured in Sunset Magazine, the New Food Economy, the local NPR station, Wall Street Journal as something to do in San Diego because people are really interested in it. It's, it's um, a great way for people, like I said, to connect with fishermen. Um, so for a lot of these reasons, it's one of the types of successes that we want to highlight at um, in Slow Fish in San Francisco. And our local slow food community, we partner with the fishermen and local chefs to put on seafood demonstrations to kind of take the scariness away from dealing with the whole fish or um, fresh raw fish, um, take that scariness away from the American public because the public by and large is, um, in the U.S. anyway, is not terribly comfortable with dealing with cooking fish, let alone whole fish. Um, they're not comfortable with it at all. So um, that's been a really popular event, um, and we're going to start those up again soon. So um, I, I touched on probably a lot of the types of issues that um, we'll also talk about more generally and specifically at Slow Food, like marketing, so direct to the consumer, um, what makes sustainable seafood, um, prices, fairness, transparency, um, and yeah, so that's a success story, That one of the success stories that we'll be talking about there. And by the way, I'm the seafood liaison at Slow Food Urban San Diego, and my background is I'm a fishery biologist for the federal government, um, and I got interested in this because of my job. People are always asking me, what should I eat? And I'm looking for a way to explain that to people. I came across slow food and I work on um, connecting people to our local fishers in San Diego um, quite a bit in my free time including partnering up with Kevin and Gary and Kelly now um, on this event so if you guys have any questions about the San Diego tuna harbor dockside market um, just give me a shout out anytime and I hope to see you all at slow fish San Francisco Great, thank you, Sarah. And uh, um, one of the leaders, fishermen leaders that helped make the market happen, uh, Peter Hallmay, um, uh, Sarah uh, made sure that Peter was with us in New Orleans. So it was great to meet him there. And he's been a good, become a good friend of us all. And uh, he's part of the uh, Slowfish um, larger planning community uh, for Slowfish San Francisco. So now we're going to turn it over to uh, Collis Stoll. And uh, um, Collis is going to talk about how how we in the slow fish community are um, developing uh, information to be able to help all everybody in the slow food community get a better understanding about slow fish and our seafood world. So call us, take it away. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, and thank you all for hopping on the call. Um, it, there's uh, you know a bit of ground to cover here, and I'll I'll be as efficient as I can. First thing I guess to explain who I am. I am not a fisheries biologist. I am not a commercial fisherman. I've not been living and breathing the slow food movement all of my life. I actually am an ex journalist um, and a PR person. So if people start hanging up, I guess I understand that, but. Uh, uh, 25 years in writing professionally for newspapers or in public relations, and I ended up 
uh, somehow blogging about sustainable fisheries. And as I, as I uh, dug into it, I, I realized, you know, there's a, a lot of information here that as someone who grew up in New Orleans with abundance of seafood, local or locally around me, I may remember when I was six, seven years old, we'd pile in our station wagon, drive down to Plaquemines Parish, and we'd buy a bushel of shrimp, and it was still flicking because it just came right off the boat. So um, that's kind of the context of my relationship to seafood. And as I dug into a lot of these issues that you know involve everything from privatization of the oceans to climate change, to regulation, to international uh, issues, uh, artisanal fisheries getting squeezed, I, it, the more I was felt compelled to, to dig into it. And at some point, I realized that for me, the best the tool that I have is to tell a story and to convey that message. So I started a nonprofit called One Fish Foundation to bring the message of what sustainable seafood is, even though sustainable is a sort of a cliched term, but what, what it means to have a relationship to seafood that we eat. And I bring that into classrooms from elementary school up into college um, and also into communities and do this via uh, dinners that bring fishermen in and people from the community with chefs who care about sourcing to talk about things, you know, like why a fisherman um, uh, what might use a rod and reel to catch ground fish. The fisherman you see on the, the slide in front of you, that's uh, Captain Tim Ryder. He fishes out of Elliott, Maine, and he jig fishes for cod and pollock and hake um, and haddock off, off the bottom in 300 feet of water. He goes out 80 miles offshore. I mean, this is not an easy life but he does it because he believes in taking care of the resource. resource. So, and this gives, these events give um, people a chance to talk to the fishermen about what they're doing. So we decided in Denver to have a discussion with people there, people who are involved with slow fish and people who are not directly involved with slow fish about why it matters, why it matters, matters why you should know where your seafood comes from, who caught it if possible, how it was caught if possible, and you know other factors that are important. Those kinds of discussions really play a role into the seafood dynamic that we have here uh, in this country. So what I want to do is I'll do a quick overview of this uh, conversation. So if you could go to the next slide, Ian, please. Um, so yeah, just keep going. So this first statistic, 90% of the seafood that we eat in this country is imported. Now, when I tell that to a bunch of middle school students, their eyes get the size of saucers. Because up here in Portland, Maine, where I am, we live in the cradle of one of the seafood capitals of the country. And when they realize that much of the seafood that is eaten in this country is coming from elsewhere, it doesn't compute. So we have the conversation about why that is. And what it really comes down to, everything that I've, you know, all the research that I've done, all the people I've talked to, it really comes down to habit. And it's habit because people aren't asking the questions that they should be asking. They're not owning their relationship to the seafood that they have. So yes, it makes perfect sense that 90% of the seafood that we eat here is imported because we're paying a lower price because we're not asking where it's coming from. Ironically, we, we harvest around 5 million tons of seafood in the United States domestically every year. And we're the number one single importer and we're the top five exporter. And it's all because of habit. It's habit, uh, it's a consumer habit. It's also a policy habit that makes it easier for cheaper imports to come in. 
And for our lobsters to go off at ridiculously high prices being sold in Asia and Europe, they can get a fair price, they get a better price there. You know, why wouldn't they do it? It's, it's just the way the consumption is. More than 50% of the seafood that is imported is farm raised. So if it's farm raised and it is imported, and you take into account the fact that the United States is by and large, one of the best managed fisheries as a whole in the world in terms of seafood safety and the way they try to try to protect the resource, then you're, you're, you're factoring in some scary things like what happens in a shrimp farm in Thailand. Um, you start talking about antibiotics, you start talking about hormones, you start talking about uh, bleach and stuff like that to deal with lice on finfish. So all of these factors come into this big picture of why from a domestic standpoint, the odds are stacked against people who are trying to do a small scale and sell it locally. This last statistic, 28% of seafood is mislabeled. That's an Oceana um, study that was done a couple of years ago. Um, I remember talking to one of the authors of the study and remarking, and she said that, you know, people uh, in uh, like some, some major seafood distributors in Boston were celebrating that, you know, they were, they were only at 19%. Well, you know, Europe is at 9% of seafood that's mislabeled. So there's an issue with transparency in the process. And again, which, which might be fed by this habit where you're just buying seafood blindly. So by having these conversations, this is one of my, my themes that I constantly say, having these conversations, one conversation at a, at a time, we can actually move the needle a bit. So uh, next slide, please. Take a quick look at the global picture. So as of 2014, aquaculture has, support, has surpassed wild caught globally for direct human consumption. Now that's a pretty significant thing. I mean, that includes a lot of, of seaweed, kelp. Um, it also includes a lot of bivalves, but there's also a fair amount of finfish aquaculture. I was at a meeting last night, I was talking about aquaculture here in Great Bay near uh, the border between New Hampshire and Maine. And, you know, the discussion was how all the feeds are improved for finfish aquaculture and, um, you know, why it's, it, there was actually a, a, a seafood shop owner there talking about how aquaculture is really, you know, the next important thing in seafood. And I've, you know, I've heard, um, superstar chefs talk about, you know, aquaculture is the only thing that's going to save seafood. And the problem is, is that there are a lot of issues with fin fish aquaculture that if we don't dive into where the problems are and what needs to be solved and the impacts, the socioeconomic impacts on small scale fishermen who are doing it the right way, we're going to allow the dynamic to continue down that path. It doesn't mean that aquaculture, you know, like bivalve aquaculture is great. Seafood, I mean, uh, seaweed and kelp, you know, there's a lot of these multi-trophic multi um, aquaculture systems where they're combining kelp aquaculture with mussels and clams. Um, and they're, they're creating this kind of environment that they can support each other. Um, and also there's some research that some forms of kelp can help lower um, the lower pH, the ocean acidification effects, like uh, Kelly was talking about demolic acid. Um, you know, it, it, it's not wide scale, but at least we're at the front edge, we're looking at this research and, and how it can be beneficial. So there are, are types of aquaculture that are good and some that need some help. Anyway, that's part of our dynamic globally. Um, 20 million tons out of, the, out of the ballpark, 95 million tons of wild seafood that we harvest goes to fish meal. 20 million tons out of that 95 million ton figure goes to fish meal. 
that is what you would feed fin fish. That's what you would feed some shrimp. Um, it also goes to pigs and chickens, but the most of it goes to fish. Now that has a lot of implications there because it means it's a stress on the herring, sardines, um, anchovies, the very important forage fish layer in the ecosystem. And I've heard scientists refer to forage fish as the probably the most significant energy transfer between plankton and alpha predators such as sharks, tuna, or whales. So putting too much stress on forage fish is a problem. Now there's there's research, you know, people have been trying to like supplant it with soy. And the problem is the nutritional profile isn't the same. Your, your omega-3s are lower than they should be. And so they're tinkering with trying to make the feed more um, ecologically balanced. Um, there's somebody that's doing research on using insects, um, but it's not economically feasible, even though it does have the right protein. So it's there's a ways to go, but it is part of this dynamic of the global picture. Um, Another thing that comes up is bycatch, and you've heard us before. It's you know unintended catch. These are estimates that are coming from both the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and from uh, NOAA, uh, based on 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 the range. Um, but bycatch is something that it, it has to do with policy and it has to do with gear type, and these are things that need to be addressed. Um, seafood demand. Well, yeah, that's going to be a big thing. Five billion people rely on seafood for 10% of their protein diet, three billion for 20%. Those numbers are going to keep keep steady, if not increasing, if, if, as, if particularly as we approach 10 billion people, you know, somewhere near uh, 2050. So, you know, a lot of people that are driving for aquaculture say that, well, that's where the solution lies. Well, it lies in a balance of things um, that include making sure that small scale fisheries that are really predominant in developing countries are safe. Um, and are able to do what they do, whether it's subsistence or at least feeding their communities so that they don't be for, they're not forced out at the expense of something that's more industrial scale. So next slide, please. So that's sort of the backdrop of the conversation about why people should care. So the next thing to talk about, what is slow fish? Slow fish is, fishermen, it's chefs, scientists, teachers, activists, consumers. It's all of us working together in these kinds of organizations, collaboration, working together in networks. You know, you, you view slow food as a network of networks of people that focus on challenges or solutions to challenges and how to work together to collaborate to make things happen. Just as it is with slow food, with slow fish, we want to shorten the link between fishermen, their communities, and the customers they serve. So Sarah's example of Tuna Harbor Dockside Market, that's one of the examples that I pointed to in Denver, because it's a beautiful example of self-motivated group of fishermen trying to level the playing field, able to work with local government I say local, state, and you know, uh, county, lo yeah, local, county, state, and actually making it happen so that now they have a very vibrant market. And the end result is to ensure good, clean, fair seafood for all. So slow fish, in, in my view, and what we're trying to, to talk about here is we're trying to grow the network of people who advocate for good, clean, fair seafood. And we're going to get to the values in just a second. Next slide, please. So this is how we go about these kinds of things. And it, it, this 
you know, I, I'm going to stress that this slide deck here is still a kind of in draft form. I mean, this is largely what I use in Denver, but we're tweaking it because things evolve over a little bit of time. But um, so what our focus is, we're creating more opportunities for fishermen. So yeah, farmers markets like Tuna Harbor Dockside Market, it's, that's what it is. It is setting up a storefront for fishermen to relate directly to their customers. Customers can ask them questions. They can learn about underutilized species, as Sarah was talking about. Um, they can see the fishermen and their families there, which is great for the families because then it's all, almost like, you know what? This can continue to the next generation. And it's good for the customers to see that. I had a conversation with Pete Halme um, last year about this. He said, this is wonderful for them because they they get to involve their families and they get to talk about um, why, you know, why they want to see if they want to see their their next generation get into it this because this vibrant community happens um community supported fisheries it's a it's taking the csa and, and transferring it to seafood you buy a share and um you then you you get something that's fresh you know where it's traced to because I'm, I'm part of uh, Cape Ann Fresh Catch, which is one of the largest community supported fisheries in the country. It's based out of Gloucester. And when our shareholders pick up their fish, they can see what boat it came from and when it was caught. Establishing that narrative, it builds their trust in us and the fishermen. And it's that trust that drives this thriving community. Um, we also, you know, work to help create new fisheries. And an example of this is that first slide of Captain Tim Ryder. In fact, that boat right there in the background is the Finlander, and that's Tim Ryder on the left. He was in what was called the common pool here, and that was everybody who did not have the quota access up here in the Northeast region for a ground fish to fish in the near shore, more prime locations, because it was ridiculously expensive. But Tim banded together with some other fishermen and worked with the Penob Penobscot East, which is a nonprofit up here. Now it's called the Maine Center for Coastal Studies. Um, and they bought quota collectively, and now they've created a a sector, which is a group of fishermen that are more aimed at hook and line fishing, which is the type of fishing that Tim does, the jig fishing. And they're helping to bring young fishermen in, which is another issue that we're going to talk about in San Francisco, which is sort of the graying of the fleet and trying to create opportunities for young fishermen who want to get in. Because if they try to do it on their own, the deck stacked against them. It's too expensive. Um, it, it, the, it just just getting a boat is expensive, obviously, but then paying to get into the fishery is expensive too. So creating these opportunities for them. Another thing that Slow Fish does, and both as both uh, uh, as both Sarah and Gary mentioned, it, educating communities. So. Um, Brett, who not on the call, but he was instrumental with the Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance in creating these things called seafood throwdowns. And the idea was to um, have a couple of chefs come together. They get an underutilized species and they have an hour to cook it. And people come together, it's like at farmer's markets. And then it's a good way to have a direct conversation with people about why it's important to know your fishermen why it's important to know you know different types of species other than cod tuna salmon um shrimp and how different ways to cook it, uh, to cook it one of the things that i've done is these uh, sustainable seafood dinners that call no fish dinners um where we have fishermen like tim come in and people get to ch a chance to ask questions we're actually go planning on doing one of these in san francisco with a theme that's focused on bringing awareness to Bristol Bay, um, as Kevin mentioned. 
Um, this, and as again, Gary mentioned as well, this is, you know, this is a priceless resource and it's under threat right now because of a proposed pebble mine. I'm sure many of you have heard of that. Um, so we're going to have a dinner there with some fishermen from Bristol Bay who will be able to talk directly to people who come there to learn more about why they're in Bristol Bay, why it matters to them, and why people need to be paying attention. Because the pebble mine's been around, you know, the, the project has been around for 10 years, but there's been enough resistance to delay it this far. We're hoping to continue that. Um, and then also, and also Sarah mentioned something about cooking and handling demonstrations, those are important. And very important in this, and this is something that'll come up in, in a big way in, in San Francisco, is supporting policies that protect fishermen and the resource. Next slide, please. So getting to the values, and I'm just gonna run through this. The good, clean, fair, as, as Sarah outlined it very well, you know, we want to make sure that people have access to something that's local, something that's seasonal, um, and something that's been handled correctly in a way and fished in a way that has minimized impact, but also supports the fishermen. So when we talk about fair, you know, honoring the dignity of labor, obviously that's been a big topic. Um, but paying a fair price to the fishermen and at the same time as sarah pointed out an accessible price for people to pay um, support community fisheries and fishermen educate seafood eaters which is what i was talking about before so they get seafood smart that's something that i i talk about and growing the network and as we all know here slow food success is by building the network so that you have more people that are engaged in these topics and willing to help find solutions creative solutions to challenges that may have been vexing us for quite a while um, so we're going to be talk talking about that as well um, also in this slide deck you know I, when i do this presentation in san francisco because I'm, I'm gonna stop now it will have present we'll have examples of successful um, slow food projects such as the tuna harbor dockside market um, we'll do the no fish dinners we'll talk about um, what's going on in bristol bay this fabulous collaboration of commercial fishermen recreational fishermen indigenous fishermen um, and local citizens from alaska and the entire united states standing up for this priceless resource so i've talked too long anyway that's sort of the high level thank you collis um really appreciate that and let everybody know that when uh when collis makes this presentation in san francisco it'll be the opening presentation of the event and we are raising funds to videotape it and uh and so what we wanted to be able to do is capture this presentation um, and it'll be, you know, calls will be accompanied by uh, fishermen representing the success stories as well. And we'll capture this in a video. And uh, one of our dreams, I think we can do it, is to actually have a Slow Fish YouTube channel. And so, again, in addition to Ian's recording this, uh, this call, is the idea to be able to archive this information so uh, it can be available to everybody. So, again, thanks, Collis, very much on that. Um, I want to turn uh, close with just a couple uh, statements about slow fish, slow food nations. But one other aspect about slow fish San Francisco that we're we're doing um, is a key component of is we've reached out to Slow Food Turtle Island, and we're collaborating with the leaders of Slow Food uh, Turtle Island to ensure that the the indigenous indigenous fishing community is well represented. Uh, at our event, and and as colleagues uh, alluded to, with the Bristol Bay um, fishery, is that we'll have uh, representatives from the Bristol Bay Native Association down with us on that. So we're very excited about that. Um, just, but just to close, a couple couple statements about uh, slow food nations. Um, last year, for those of you who attended, you may have strayed away from the Taste Marketplace and gone up uh, Laramie Avenue and seen the pop up. 
uh, slow fish seafood row that we did. And uh, so we had uh, Lance Nacio with wild shrimp, Gulf shrimp from New Orleans, and Collis did a gumbo. We had some oysters from uh, um, from Baja, and uh, I was cooking some uh, Bristol Bay sockeye salmon and Jeremy Brown, uh, fisherman from uh, the uh, Salish Sea, uh, up above Seattle, he was doing some wonderful black cod. So we wanted to have a, a, a seafood forward presentation at Slow Food Nation. So to give um, the uh, participants, both in terms of slow food delegates, but also uh, the local uh, folks who attended the nations, to be able to have be able to enjoy the uh, the wonderful uh, the taste of the seafood that we've uh, that we've alluded to throughout this uh, presentation here. Um, we're in conversations with the planners for Slow Food Nations 18, and uh, um, it looks like we've all learned a good bit from uh, 17, Slow Food Nation 17, and uh, taking that uh, learning and lessons learned to try to figure out what kind of presentation to have at 18. So we will, um, Slow Fish will be represented in the leadership day. Um, um, we may by that time have the uh, the version, the videotape version of Collis's Slow Food 101 that we can use as a as a presentation um, uh, to to prime a presentation. We'll we'll have policy conversations there at on the leadership day, and then when it gets into the food portion of Slow Food Nations, um, we'll probably Slow Fish will probably have one or you know maybe two booths in the taste marketplace, um, and this will be a a, a, a change from our time at 17 because we were up the reason why we were up on Laramie Street is because we wanted to cook seafood and the taste marketplace doesn't allow cooking to go on and so that's why we're um, up up on the other street well this year I think we'll have a um, have a couple booths that take mar marketplace where we'll have more information and and shelf stable products but then there's the potential to have pop-up um, pop-up seafood events within some of the other tented areas um, and uh, stuff. So we're, we're, we will, Slow Fish will be in presence at Denver. It'll be a variation of what we did last year. So I think that's it, Ian, um, for what we have to present at this time. You know, we filled the hour up. If there, you know, how do you want to move forward with questions? Great, thanks. Um, yeah, let's, let's take questions. Um, if you have a question, please chat, or I can unmute um, everyone if we want to try that route. Okay, I, I just, Ian, I just see a, a note from Charity. Yes. Um, and uh, about the nexus to policy in the federal um, and local. And so, yeah, so, so, um, but Charity and I both serve on the Slow Food USA policy steering committee and we will have that steering committee policy steering committee will have a presence also at uh, at, at slow food nations with the uh, the leadership day and um and we're looking to look at uh, things like the plate to the pacific or the pacific to the plate but looking at you know giving people a, a chance our, our our delegates to be able to understand what may be very at, at first blush a confusing matrix of policy at the state, local, and federal level um, that surrounds seafood and maybe makes it uh, um, kind of confusing. So we will take pains to help to kind of decomplexify that and make that understandable, as well as give people um, some tools to be able to be actively involved to support the, the policies that will support as Collis says, our, our, our community-based fishermen and, and, and retain the abundancy of, of fish in, in, the, in the ocean and the seas too. So thanks for that prompt, uh, Journey. So I'm seeing from Fritz, is there a date for uh, slow fish? Yeah, yeah. so Ian, Ian, uh, it reminded us that Slowfish San Francisco is on April 14th to the 16th. And Ian, I think um, uh, maybe there's a follow-up uh, email uh, message that burst out or maybe have on the website, uh, direct people on the website on Slow Food USA to have a link to our Slowfish San Francisco um, uh, website. Okay. 
Um, I think it's Sarah, Sarah. Can you put in a in a message there what what the the website is uh, for Slowfish San Francisco? I think Kelly's on the bus right now, uh, but we can get that yeah. to you. The other th cool. So the other thing you want me to just back to yeah, Sarah. Why don't you just go put it in into the message uh, block for now? Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it's already there. And so the it's already been okay, put on. Okay, cool. Okay, cool, cool. So, so thank you. So one other thing back to Slowfish San Francisco is also we're going to come out uh, next week with a GoFundMe uh, project um, to raise money to help subsidize fishermen to come in. We want it. We we would dearly like to get Tim Ryder, uh, the the fisherman that uh, that call us pro, uh, profiled, get him to come from Maine out so people can meet Tim the fisherman in the flesh. Um, so uh, we will ask you know for support or circulation of that uh, that GoFundMe project. Ask Slow Food USA to help us circulate that that uh, out and about. So stay tuned for that, folks. Oh, good. Thanks, Bob, for putting the to putting the website up. Yeah, and then Sarah's put up uh, in the notes. Uh, we have a we have a um, a couple. Uh, well, we have uh, the a Facebook page. The uh, link that Sarah's put up in the notes on the in the chat will take you to that Facebook page for uh, for the event. So Bob's asked, when will the topics for panel discussions be finalized? We've got a meeting scheduled on the 28th uh, for the core group on, the, on developing the program. Um, and uh, at, that's at that time, we, uh, we're working right now to help call us finalize the, the, the presentation on slow fish and then the afternoon set on Sunday following the morning presentation on slow fish 101. Because we're we'll, we're going to um, we're, we're we're declaring this is a model we set up in Slowfish New Orleans where we have presentations and then we have sessions where people can dive deeper into uh, themes that are uh, more particular themes or specific issues that they want to dive into. And so after next Wednesday the 28th, we'll have a better read on that, and there should be some. We'll we'll send that internally out to our larger program uh, committee. By the way, folks, it's really, it's really a lot of fun with this. Uh, um, we've, got a, we've got an email list of 90 people that are basically um, some very active, some just uh, attending and chiming in occasionally, but that's our email address list for developing the slow for San Francisco. So it's a broad engagement. I'm very excited about that. We're having conference calls that are having up to sometimes we've had 30 people uh, engage in the calls, uh, so it's just very heartening when you, when as as Kala says, when we're when we're developing uh, um, the network around slow fish, there there are folks that are stepping up and and, and really getting engaged. So very exciting. Any other questions? I think, Ian, we're, we're just we're going over the one o'clock uh, time, the one hour note. Um, Ian, is there a way to uh, give the email, uh, at least maybe have people direct questions initially to myself and I can distribute it to the other team members if they don't want to, if we would just keep simple. Um, but please, Ian, you know, just make, a, make it, make, make, Make sure to the slow food community that we're very, very available and welcome any kind of questions at all. And uh, like to see folks uh, promote Slow Fish San Francisco um, in any way they can and attend if they can as well. Great. Thank you, Kevin, for all of this information and sort of organizing this call. And thanks to Gary, Kelly, Sarah, Collis, Kevin, again. Uh, lots of good stuff, and I just want to say this was the first um, of the sort of leader call that we're going to try to do um, in the lead up to Slow Food Nations. The next one that we have scheduled is on March 22nd um, with, with a focus on gardens. And then in April on the 26th, um, it will be a pol policy-centered uh, call. So keep an eye out, and we will... 
<clears throat> get the information out um, within the next few weeks. Great. Thank you again, Ian, and thanks, crew, Slurfish crew, and uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, for attending. Be good. Be careful. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.